The Koi Gig Pod on Off The Ball in association with Cadbury, official snack partner of the Republic of Ireland women's national team. Katie McCabe, a huge, huge goal. I'm very proud of the team's performance. We're going to go out there to beat them. We're going to try and beat them. Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Koi Gig Podcast. Kathleen McNamee here and I am coming to you from the Off The Ball studio today. I get to have the fancy seat for once and I am joined on the line as ever by Piemont Captain Karen Duggan. Karen, another very good weekend for you guys. I mean, very good result-wise. I wouldn't say performance-wise, but I couldn't give two hoots about the performance at this stage of the season. <laughs> well, you guys are very close out. I mean, there's only three rounds left for you guys. I know some teams had a mm-hmm. delayed game, but you only have three games left. Wexford, and you play Sligo on the final day. And who's in the middle again? Away to Galway. Away to so Galway, that's it, Of yeah. the teams who are fighting, I think our running is, you know, pretty tricky. So I don't think we're getting ahead of ourselves at all. Um, three games sounds like very little, but in the greater context of things, it's it's kind of not when there's only 11 teams in it. So we'll take it one game at a time away to Wexford this weekend. Um, obviously, they had a late draw against Bowes, so they'll probably be feeling kind of good with the way that they ended that game. So we have to be careful and... Do our best, Kathleen. We're doing our best. Oh, Karen, I could like hear it in your voice. You're being so like, it's fine. Everything is fine. Oh, I'm not stressed gosh. at all about this. <laughs> I think if you show the video of this and you see how many wrinkles I've developed over this season, you would know that um, your summation of me there is correct. I'm very stressed. <laughs> Well, to give you something pleasant to talk about, uh, one of your favourite players, because uh, you often talk about Aaron McLaughlin getting those two goals at the weekend. I imagine that did make you very, very happy. It did. It did indeed. Um, Aaron, again, she's just, she's one of those players who um, she just brings excitement to a game um, and we want her to start getting more goals. So I selflessly passed on the penalty taking to Aaron because... She's better at them than me. <laughs> but can you love taking them so much? <laughs> oh, my God. What a relief. I owe her a lot. I'll buy her a drink at the end of season party. Yeah, well, I think it's looking like you'll have a lot to celebrate at the end of season party. We are not talking about that yet, Kathleen. Stop now. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not. I'm not trying to stress you out of your afternoon. I promise. I promise. I will move on <laughs> swiftly, so you don't have. But we to... do know that Rovers picked up a big win against Shells mm-hmm. at the weekend. So, um, I guess obviously people are saying it's down to kind of the two horse race now. Um, and what an interesting race! Yeah, I'm very for the neutral. For the neutral. <laughs> Well, because they also have the FA Cup as well this weekend. So their focus isn't fully on the league. Um, they're playing Shelburne at the weekend and then Sligo Rovers are also playing Athlone. I imagine in their heads, they're still gunning for both the league and the cup. It kind of isn't really a take one over the other situation. No, no, not at all. Like I, can, I heard um, Colly O'Neill say in, in one of his interviews that he didn't give a hoot about the league table, just about performances. And... I just am not buying that at all. Everyone gives a hoot about the league table, especially when you're one of the teams who are going for the title, which they are, and are in a strong position to continue to contend that. So I'm not having a bar of it. I always find that really funny because could you imagine a manager like getting to the end of the season having not looked at the table once and just being like, oh, we came third. Fair play to oh, us. Oh, but we played really well. <laughs> Wait now. Don't yeah. be annoying me. <laughs> you care. You do care. Yeah. Everyone cares. Of course you do, because you can't like judge what you need or judge your performances or even like the team you're going to put out if you don't know your, like if you're 12, 15 points at the top of the table and you only have two games left and you know it's absolutely one for you, of course you're going to look at the table and be like, oh, well, I can give maybe a few younger players a run out or can test some formations or do something. Whereas if you're like a point off whoever is top of the table and it's the final game of the season, you're going to want to know that. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. But anyway, yeah, I think that the cup ties will be interesting this weekend. Um, I think Shells will obviously have a point to prove, but it'll be interesting to see if this is a symptom of how they're 
playing or if it was just one of those games because we can kind of all have one of those games and we had errors against shells early in the season where we just couldn't get to grips with it and conceded silly goals and then that's it's very hard to claw your way back from that and I think that was kind of what it looked like I didn't see the game but it looked like you know that a couple of the goals they conceded were soft and then it's hard to kind of come back against a team like Rovers who are so solid kind of defensively and especially on that pitch I mean it's a big big pitch and it suits Mm. their style of play very well so I think going a goal down there is difficult never mind going three goals down Mm. and um, any eagle-eyed listeners or viewers of the podcast if you watch it on YouTube will notice there's just the two of us here today Karen Uh, we had another announcement last week that Eileen Gleeson and her team are keeping staying on um, for the next international break. So Emma has busy and important things to be at today, which is uh, very upsetting for us, but hopefully means very good things for the Ireland team. Right decision to keep on the interim management for the next couple of games and just give the FAI a bit more time to scope out potential managers. I think they said in that statement that they had a long list and they're going to start whittling it down now. Well, I think it's encouraging to hear that there is a long list. Obviously, we don't know the caliber of coaches that they have on that list yet. Um, They're fairly tight-lipped about that. Um, But I think we said it generally, the backroom staff anyway, if I was a new coach coming in, I think they're nearly like the perfect backroom staff in terms of Emma and Colin anyway. So I think that they're... I think a lot of people will be happy to see them stay on for this because obviously off the back of two wins, but also potentially given people who may remain involved more experience in these upcoming Nations League games. um, I'd be happy to see the background staff as it is, but obviously whatever manager comes in, they're going to have their own ideas, own coaches that they're used to working with. And it's in the hands of the FAI now, and we just have to trust them. Well, it's funny because I feel like you're laughing at the idea of trusting the situation. <laughs> um, well, see, the thing is, like, it'd be very easy for us to sit here and obviously we've Emma on the podcast and we know she's a legend, but like, there actually seems to be quite a big consensus across Irish football community in general that a lot of people would be happy enough to see the background team stay on. You know, there's a lot of respect for the information and knowledge that is in there. And I'll be really curious to see... Like if they go for a manager who isn't as au fait with like the Irish system, maybe he's from England or a European Mm -hmm. manager or something, if they decide to keep on those people as ones who understand the systems here and understand, you know, the history of the Irish team and have been in the entire thing and they'll see that as a addition, I suppose, to whatever knowledge they'll bring or if it as you say, will it be someone that comes in and is like, I want, you know, clean slate people that I know and I can work with? Yeah, it's really, it's an interesting one. I think for international management, I think it's always good to have people who have knowledge of not only kind of like the football style and stuff that we play, but also like the association and the history there and everything that comes with that. Um, The only thing that's probably missing if Eileen goes is the link to the League of Ireland and then it depends on how much that's valued generally anyway um, but I, th- I think it can only be a good thing to have people who are Irish Irish based because it just it brings something I think important to a national team like it doesn't have to be the main coach but having people around the squad who understand what it means to pull on the green jersey and obviously I'm as a record holder in that regard so here's hoping but also hoping that she's allowed to join us on the pod to give us the inside scoop <laughs> yeah exactly she will actually be here um most weeks for the podcast no matter what with the WSL to give us all her thoughts it was just today in particular that she was unavailable so in case anyone's sitting at home panicking um one of the questions that we got in Karen during the week was from at underscore Walsall Yellow Their profile picture is one of Katie McCabe, so I'm assuming a Katie McCabe fan. And they were wondering, do you have any opinion on what qualities that Eileen Gleeson has as a person and a coach that we must have, as in capital letters, uh, with our permanent manager, whoever that may be? Uh, I think Eileen delivers um, information in a nice, concise, direct way. You know what she wants. There's no ambiguity between things. And I think that's important to be that way when you have 
little contact time with your players. Um, there's there's no bedding in period where you get to know their their personalities and their way of communicating, and that because that can be a cultural thing as well. So I think being very clear, direct, and open with their communication is I think that's an attribute that Eileen has in abundance. Um, and obviously, you want someone who is completely solely dedicated to this Ireland team and they see it as I think a long-term project and are conscious of where we are now um obviously off the back of a World Cup win and what it means to make that success sustainable um and they come in with a clear vision of that and obviously Eileen is director of women's head of women's football and that's pretty that's in her remit as well but I think it's also something that the national coach keep, needs to keep an eye on as well yeah, definitely. And we'll be looking forward to those games that are coming up. Um, I think the match in Tala sold out already, so I don't think you can actually get tickets for it. But... Which is great because it's not at an ideal time or no. day, you know, on a Friday evening in Tala. So if everyone who's bought a ticket comes out, I think, I mean, like, it goes to show the level of interest that there is in this team now and how people are getting behind the team. Um and it's great to see. And obviously off the back of the Aviva, we're saying we can get these massive crowds. We've always kind of nearly struggled to fill out Tala Stadium, but now it has to be the time that we completely do that. Yeah, definitely. I think you even see it like in the WSL, obviously, you know, Arsenal had that yeah, massive game at the Emirates and now they're playing Aston Villa there next week or this weekend. And it's already got 30,000 tickets sold, I think was the last I saw on Twitter yesterday. It could be more at yeah. this stage, to be honest, but... It just goes to show when you give people these places, they can fill them out. And it's just, it's almost mm -hmm. a pity that we don't have like a RDS side grounds. Like I always think it'd be great to have that yeah. kind of in between -y stage so I that agree, you're yeah. not trying to have the massive affair every time initially, but you do. Still yeah. Have something. And even just a, a stadium like that, when it's say 20,000, if that's sold out, it can be like a cauldron and I think creates an unbelievable atmosphere. So, yeah. Who knows in the future? Maybe now that we're hosting the Euros, there'll be yeah, all sorts maybe. going on. We shall see. We shall see at uh, Leinster Rugby if you want to get on to us. Uh, we shall put you in contact with the right people. Um, coming up a little bit later on the show, we will have all the analysis from the WSL this weekend. But first up, we are going to have Emma Carroll's Team of the Week. Now we have Emma Carroll back with us this week for another one of her Team of the Weeks. Um, Emma, we had an interesting place to watch the Arsenal United game on Friday night. Uh, me, yourself and producer Catherine were all at Emeralds, which are, for anyone who doesn't know, the kind of Irish radio awards. And Off the Ball was up for several awards, which we all won. Uh, and special shout out to Ashling O'Reilly, who got uh, silver in the broadcasting category. She did a lot of the reporting on the Irish women's team and does a lot of reporting across all sorts of different sports. So we want to say a special congratulations to her. Koi Gig is up for an award later on in the year. Uh, we will be at the Irish Podcast Awards. So we were really just there to enjoy the crack, have a bit of fun, have a few drinks and watch Manchester United versus Arsenal at the table. <laughs> <laughs> all shook when we seen the Arsenal lineup. Yeah, very <laughs> shook when we saw six changes, I think it was, in total, yeah. um, which we will dive into a little bit later on. But Emma, I enjoyed this Team of the Week. There was a lot of unfamiliar faces in it, which I always think makes for an interesting Team of the Week. Do you want to give us a little run through it and then we can discuss it? Yeah, so we've got Keaton in goal and then a back four of Koi Visto Alexandri again, Jenna Clark and Ashley Neville. Welcome back, Ashley. Um <laughs> <laughs> I can't really pronounce her name, I don't think. Atiani made her debut for Spurs this weekend. Uh, Hines and then Kelly, Russo, Galton and Peterman up front. And I probably could have gotten another three or four Liverpool players in if I really wanted to. <laughs> I was thinking of you when I was watching the Liverpool game because I was uh, still nursing Friday night, even though it was Sunday evening. And it was Sunday evening, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> the weekend is still a little bit of a blur, guys. Give us a. Um, but yeah, I was just thinking of you, and I was like, Emma is going to be very, very happy with herself. This has been a good weekend. Excellent. I mean, how are you feeling? Top of the table? Well, nearly. Leicester are just pipping uh, you, which yeah. is not something I ever thought I would say. It's, it's just by alphabetical order as well. It's not even goal difference. So we'll take it. <laughs> that was a good start to the season. Um, big Merseyside derby on Sunday. So they haven't won at Anfield yet. So that will be a. 
an interesting game to see if that can change this season. Mm. Karen, what were your thoughts on this team of the week when it came through? Yeah, I think, like you said, it's it's a lot of new names in there, but rightly so. Um, just to start with the goalkeeper, Kiara Keating, um, obviously a lot of pressure on her coming in, a lot of talk around the panel of goalkeepers at Man City at the moment and what's going on there. And Gareth Taylor was questioned on it, obviously, at the weekend. But in a game where, obviously, they were down players and Chelsea were starting to bombard their goal, uh, towards the end to try and get that equaliser. I thought that she put in such a mature performance for her age. Um, she was alert to everything. Um, and yeah, like they were, they were. I thought Man City were were brilliant considering everything they came up against in that game and, and Keating was a big part of that. So in a, another weekend where the big talking point around keepers was maybe mistakes. It's nice to have some a standout performance by a keeper as well. So she thoroughly deserved that. And similarly, her teammate Alexandri for that tackle. The yeah. The it was her that did the the last dish tackle in the box. You have to time that to perfection. So that's that's brilliant. And yeah, Jenna Clark obviously coming from Glasgow City to Liverpool. Like it's a it's a big move, but I mean Liverpool are great. And like you say, you could have had more people in there. So you got Heinz in there. Um, and you got, who else did you get in there? Koi Visto. Could have had Hoi Binger, Visto. Bonner, Holland, even Mel Lawley when she came Yeah, back well. I think Hoi Binger, um, I think Hoi Binger, anyone who played on the wings, particularly the left wing for Liverpool, I thought that that was so dangerous in, in attack. And yeah, that was very, very good. Um, I I'm trying to think. I maybe the only people I would possibly question maybe mm, big names as well. Maybe Galton and Russo, just because maybe you get West Ham's Wakey in. Is it Wakey? Is that Wakey, how you pronounce yeah. it? Yeah, Wakey. I thought she probably put her hand up for something. Um, there she was. She was really really good. Um. But not too many complaints, I guess. Well, you don't usually go for many defensive players, so to have, I'm happy that you you put four <laughs> actual defenders in the team this week. But four, there was a, uh, there could have been more well, even. I thought, um, yeah. yeah, and I thought <laughs> just because you know how much we love her chaotic energy, um, Sissoko was very good at the <laughs> yeah, weekend, and yeah. I always like to see her in there. But uh, not too many complaints. Yeah, I, I still every time I watch Kim Little play, I'm like, yeah, she's the best player in the pitch. We'll put her in. I know. Um, but yeah, I guess Galton was good. I think she was possibly your other person that you could have put another Liverpool player in if you were to switch someone out. But obviously, she she got the goal that kicked off um, Man United's performance there on Friday, and Chloe Kelly was back to being Chloe Kelly, which was great. Yeah, no, she was very good. I. I'm actually annoyed this is the one week that Emma Byrne isn't here to talk about goalkeepers because I just I feel like <laughs> I wanted to get her thoughts on Kira Keating and the whole situation at D'Angelo. Manchester United yeah. and like swapping into Angelo and I just feel like even like uh, Muscovich and Anne Katrin Berger like there's just so many good talking points around goalkeepers mm. in the league at the moment I said good talking points it doesn't necessarily mean that they're all performing exactly well <laughs> yeah. like it feels it's weird because I feel like for the World Cup, we had so many conversations about the standard of goalkeeping and how good it was. And then even some of the regulars that you would normally trust in the league maybe haven't shown that they're quite up to even the Even Mary Earps' kicking was a bit mm, at mm. the weekend. Now, I don't think she could have done anything about the goals. But um, yeah, you're right. This is... This probably too much to talk about in terms of your keeper. And I know Jonas Adebel said, oh, he wants to get away from the idea of a number one goalkeeper. Isn't it I interesting though? It's very arsehole. That's ridiculous. I just asked that's it ridiculous. a week after you Arteta said the same one. thing. Yeah. No, 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 no. You have a number one goalkeeper. <laughs> like, they're the backbone of your defence. They're like an on-field coach and you need to be completely comfortable with them. And they, yeah, and understand their ways of communicating. Um, yeah, no. Do you um, think this is something, though, that will become more normal? Because it's become such a regular point of conversation because of Arsenal across, like, the men's and the women's game. Like, obviously, you have the David Rea 
Ramsdale situation. You know, you even have it a little bit now with Chelsea and you're kind of wondering, and City as well, you're like wondering, well, who is the number one starter there? Is there a possibility that it's going to be swapped? I know, I know like sometimes it'll swap between, say, league and cup competitions. Mm-hmm. But it feels like now in the league, it could literally be anyone in that number one, which yeah, is a little bit strange. I think it's, I kind of, I don't know what you feel about this. I think it's only ever questioned when weaknesses or cracks in someone's in the original number one game starts to show yeah Mm. that would be my view on it yeah i just feel like the narrative is slightly changing where it's like okay well this player has a really good distribution of the ball this player is really good with the ball at their feet this player can do that and i'm like is it almost go well i know it's not really comparable but you're starting to think well is is the role going to start changing the way, say, we've seen it change in GA, where, you know, all of a sudden goalkeepers became number one free takers mm. and, you know, they're playing further up the pitch and they're bombing up the pitch with the ball and someone's sitting back. I'm not expecting yeah. anyone to do, like, an Olivier Giroud and end up in the... Yeah. <laughs> but fundamentally, you want your goalkeeper to be very good at stopping goals. That is their primary that job. Helps. And if they are good with their feet, that's obviously a brilliant addition. But... Yeah. I know. Look I feel at like, like, look at, look at Man, you, you look at Man United. <laughs> look at Man United men. Like they changed because they wanted to change their approach to, you know, playing out and someone who's better with their feet than De Gea was. And now <laughs> Onana, oh, no, no. well. his, his wrists are questionable. You can get those <laughs> wrists into the gym. Yeah. I don't know where it's come from as well because I, I watched him quite a lot before he joined United and I definitely didn't think of him as the sort of player that he is but anyways we won't we won't go into Maybe the Premier League Man United the, thing to be honest I do think there is a little bit of that around the place at the moment yeah. um, Emma who was your standout performer then of the week Keating was excellent um, and Alexandru I think for City as well um, but I'm going to go with Clark for Liverpool interesting I thought she was brilliant I just th- I think the whole Liverpool defence at the moment is brilliant Yeah, which you know gives you a bit of worry because when Nifa, he comes back to be fit. Like at the moment, you're probably not putting her back in there when it's such a stable defensive force. Like, mm. yeah, and I think like to adapt to the WSL coming from Scotland and to adapt that quickly in two games where you're up against opponents who are seen as stronger on paper than you. Like you'd look, I've looked at those fixtures and said, God, what a tough kind of start of the season Liverpool have. And to adapt that quickly, I think is a testament to the defence, Jenna Clark, and obviously. Matt Beers the way he's has them playing because it, it is quite I feel like everyone knows their job um, and you'd like to see it lasting and you hope that they kick on from here um, I would like to see if this Leanne I'm sure you would to score some goals while that defence is that would be nice it. yeah <laughs> that would be pretty nice well, uh, Julie Fatter she has you guys winning the cup the so, FA Cup yeah, yeah I'll take it so yeah. I think, well, at this stage, you might as well go for (laughs) anything. Um, Emma, thank you very much for joining us once again. And thank you for all your hard work and that lovely new graphic. We'll have the team of the week up on our Twitter at the Koi Gig Pod. So if you have any thoughts about it, please do let us know. Or if you're watching games of the weekend and you think you have some ideas of people that should be in the team of the week for Emma, you can make her job a little bit easier because I can tell you after a couple (laughs) of times of doing team of the weeks, uh, they are very, very difficult. and It's a lot of matches to watch. So please do get them into us at the Koi Gig Pod there too and we will pass them on to Emma. Emma, thank you. Thank you. And now we shall turn our attention to the games at the weekend in full and might as well start with the first game of the weekend because it was our two teams, Karen, going up against each other, Manchester United 2, Arsenal 2. Um... I don't think I've celebrated a goal as much as I did that Lacasse one in a while. And I promise that wasn't the free Prosecco that I had had that <laughs> night. But, uh, I mean, it was a clash rush. Um, and United had a great game as well in terms of their new signings. We had Mallard getting a goal in the 81st minute, which I thought was a nail in Arsenal's coffin. It felt like a win that both sides needed, but also that both sides were finding it very hard to secure yeah I it's it's a hard one I think from both their perspectives as a fan because really like Man United you know you're 2-1 up with a couple of games to 
or a couple of minutes to go, you, you manage the game, you manage the game, but they had expended so much energy because Arsenal were the better team, particularly in the second half. But to get yourself in front, you're always disappointed to concede in the last couple of minutes. And then for Arsenal, I guess it's disappointing because they were the better team, but they allowed Man United to to take the lead in the way that they did will be really, really disappointing because two, I would say two defensive errors are very, very avoidable situations um, to concede from. But then you also have the elation of scoring a, a cracker in the last minute. So a lot of mixed emotions between the two of us, I would say. Yeah, a lot of mixed emotions. I mean, we said it there when we were doing the team of the week. There was six changes for Arsenal. It was a weird atmosphere even going into the game because Arsenal mm. announced on the Thursday that Adeval had signed a new long-term contract. They didn't actually specify, I don't think, how long the contract was, which is a very Arsenal thing. They did the same thing with Arteta when he was kind of not having a great run of form, but it was so funny when I saw the announcement, I just thought about the conversation that we had with Emma the other week and the fact that, you know, maybe the you know, the man management side of things is good, but the in-game coaching isn't there in the way that it should be. And I just found it interesting. Like we saw the pieces of paper again this weekend <laughs> and the formation yeah. changes. We saw it again. And I just, I wonder where, but like, where is that coming from? The only time I remember seeing it recently was in the Euros final. And was it Jill Scott or someone was trying to see what the Germans were handing around it was mm. towards the end of the game? It's just not something you see in football anymore and to me it does kind of show that there's like a lack of understanding in games if something changes you know if they switch up formation this, yeah, is, this is what we do this is where we go this is how we swap these yeah. positions yeah and i saw kim little was questioned on it um the change in formation bid match and she said obviously it's it's difficult but with the quality that they have they they are able to adapt and they trust each other to do that. But And that's obviously the correct answer to that question. But as a player, that uncertainty for it to happen at three games in a row now, including two losses and a draw, it, it doesn't inspire confidence. Yeah, it's great to be able to do these things, but let's nail that down on the training ground pre-season. And, um, and yeah, six changes. You know, it's... Obviously, it shows that they have a lot of strength and depth, but that's a that's a huge statement as well. Mm. Well, there was also the argument from Emma last week that you know the strongest players weren't necessarily starting and getting their opportunities. Um, we talked a little bit about it in the team of the week, but the Sabrina D'Angelo picked ahead of Zinsberger, obviously yeah. gifting that goal to Leah Galton, and it just. I suppose it highlights even more why Arsenal were so keen to get Mary Earps during the summer. But you'd have to wonder, and this is something I've been thinking about, you know, like say Chelsea picked up Nicky Everard, who was great last summer for yeah. in the Euros. And, you know, she's on loan out in Brighton. She's not actually playing. You even have the likes of like Courtney Brosnan or someone who's playing on, sitting on the bench. And I'm like, there's a lot of decent goalkeepers in the league. And I'm confused as to why maybe there wasn't a backup option I know D'Angelo was kind of seen as the backup option but from what I have seen so far I don't have a massive amount of faith and I know I don't have a whole lot to judge that on but it just feels like they're yeah, it's strange especially when I guess it wasn't expressly said when they were so keen on getting Mary Earps like it was, was it, is it just Mary Earps or no one or is it the quality of Mary Earps that you want and Again, if that's going around, it, it, it's not going to help the goalkeepers who you then have to be like, oh, we'll go back to you. So <laughs> if I have to, I suppose I will. If I must. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was an unfortunate error. Um, she just got her feet wrong, really, didn't she? She panicked. Um, it was just indecision. And again, it, more maybe with more game time, she doesn't make that mistake. And mm. obviously with all the talk around it, it, it was it going to be a nervous moment for her because I saw her one time last season and I was really impressed with her mm. and I was kind of like oh maybe she is a very good option there particularly with all the uncertainty around Zinsberger but yeah didn't cover herself in glory but I also don't think the Arsenal defence covered themselves in glory for the second goal I, you could say the keeper could come out and demand that one there but I don't know I think that that one should have been cleared as well so yeah two 
two defensive areas, not great from an Arsenal point of view. When you had the likes of Jen Beattie, who actually played really, really well. Mm. Yeah, I saw Leah Williamson saying that she is aiming to be back in January in some capacity. Um, but what that will be, and obviously there's still quite a lot of time to go and she could suffer setbacks or whatever. But um, I think a lot of Arsenal fans will be very, very happy to see her returning to the pitch and just marshalling things a little bit better. I think. Yeah, because if you, especially if you're going to go down this route of not having uh, an established number one goalkeeper who would usually be the person who marshals the defence, then having someone with Lee Williamson's leadership and obviously talent can only be a good thing. Yeah, I mean, like you look at the table, it doesn't make for great reading as an Arsenal fan. Like, I know we're only two games into the season, yeah, but the fact that... I know, but there's like, there isn't a lot of teams. There isn't a lot of games in the league no. and these things do matter. You know, you look mm -hmm. at Leicester at the top of the table well, with six points the point and Arsenal I, are ninth I on really one point. Think, <laughs> yeah, again, this, like, points now you say, oh, they don't matter, but for a team like Leicester who were, like, treading relegation last year, having that many points at this stage of the season is... Um, it's an unbelievable boost for them. Oh, completely. Like, so Arsenal fans don't need to be like down in the dumps, but you're right. Every point is is significant and they will feel like, I think they'll feel like five points lost very much. I, th I still will think Arsenal, I think that they'll feel like they should have beaten Man United based on the two teams' performances. I thought United did well to stay with them given how how decent Arsenal were. Um, oh, the La Classe goal alone, that deserved a, a winner for yeah. Arsenal. I mean, what a moment. She whipped it in and she almost looked mm. in disbelief herself when it went in. And I do think United did stand off her a bit in that. Like, I think they should have shut yeah. her down a lot quicker, but it's still an impressive strike. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think, um, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, at that stage, you have to put it down to tired legs, but I do think there was enough people close to her to at least try and unbalance her. Um, and now we know what kind of strike she has. I think teams will learn a lot from her, just do something foul or do anything because that was an absolute peach of a strike. But it was good to see kind of the new signings for Man United as well. Like JC looks like she can cause a lot of problems. It's just maybe that final decision-making. I think Emma might've referenced it in, con in um, commentary as well. Um, but she she does look like dangerous, and you hope that maybe when she gets off the mark that it, the the goals will start coming. Um, and then Mallard, like she only got to that ball for to put that in the back of the net because of her pace, like mm. her I'm pace really over five to yards to get in season. there. I can't wait to see her. So, well, Man United weren't absolutely amazing. I think getting a draw against Arsenal and seeing signs of what's to come. I think. There's, I'm still feeling positive that they could still challenge for the Champions League place. I think it's very much dependent on how Arsenal do. Because again, looking at Chelsea, Man City, I think Man City are going to be there or thereabouts this season. Mm. Well, thank and you for so that beautiful... And it's so early to be saying all this. Yeah. But, well. <laughs> well, thank you for that beautiful segue into Manchester City versus yes. Chelsea. Um this game Madness. was chaotic Madness. beyond belief. I mean, if <laughs> we, we love thought, the chaos. If we thought Fiji Portugal was chaotic in the Rugby World Cup, <laughs> yeah. this was like equal levels of chaos. So 11 cards issued, yellow cards issued. There was 13 in total because there was two red cards. Um, four for Alex Greenwood and Lauren Hemp alone in the yellow cards, which is a bit mental. Um, if anyone hasn't seen it, actually, there's a really good piece in The Athletic today about the refereeing in the WSL by Charlotte Harper. And um, she basically sits in on a private coaching call with Rebecca Welch, who a lot of people will know from coaching in the men's game as well as the WSL. And it's just really interesting going into how referees review the decisions that they made. And they talk about her first game of the season, which was actually Aston Villa, Manchester United, and everything that went on in that, and the sending off that was there. Um, because obviously the main talking point after the weekend was officiating because of those 11 yellow cards in the Man City game. Um, so I really would recommend anyone that has an athletic subscription to read that one. But where do you fall on the Greenwood time-wasting yellow card oh, incident absolute <laughs> nonsense it was absolute nonsense like i think they counted it it was something was it even 30 seconds no it was 26 it was seconds. Like 26 seconds and that 
included the time it took for the ball to go to the spot where the free was to be taken from and for Greenwood mm. to come over where they decided she was the person to go and take it. So she probably dallied over the ball for 15 seconds. Yeah, it was 20 seconds, seconds in a 90 minute game. When you're the centre back, it's early in the game. You're absolutely not time wasting um, because this, the referee should use like discretion there because you, like this is a game that Man City want to win. They're not going to be sitting there being like, oh, we'll start time wasting in the 30 something minutes. Mm. It's, you know, I thought it was absolutely ludicrous um, and completely unfair on Greenwood. I, I don't think she did anything wrong. No, it was completely unfair. Um, just to give everyone that's listening like a little bit of background, so Greenwood was booked in the 17th minute for a foul, and then on the 37th minute, free kick, she was booked again for time wasting, which meant it went straight mm. to a red card, which is kind of ridiculous when you looked at what Man City got away in the Premier League with Kovacic. But anyways, that's a t- totally different story. Mm-hmm. As I said, she spent 26 seconds over the ball. The average in the league so far between this year and last year was between 32 to 34 seconds. So again, she was still under the average and not above the time-wasting limit in general. thought it was interesting as well. I saw another stat that uh, Lisa Evans, who was also penalised, I think it was last week, I don't think it was this week, for delaying a throw-in. Um, so after 11 seconds, she was penalised for that. But the average across the league last season was 16 seconds. So we do know this is something that Big Mull, um, the referee and board have said that they're trying to crack down on, but this just seems like ridiculous. There has to be an asterisk that says within reason. Yeah. Or I mean, are you going to start like a stop clock or something? Nonsense about it. Oh, I, like, just use your, your noggin there. Like, you know when someone's time wasting and you know when they're not, when they're just taking time to set up and maybe calming things down after they've been under a bit of pressure and that's part of the game and it should remain part of the game within reason and you also think you get a couple of warnings as well like if you are genuinely uh, taking too much out of it the referee turns to alex greenwood and says here come on snap snap let's get this going no you have to give her a warning and yeah the first yellow card it was a free Mm. Uh, but it was early enough in the game that she hadn't done a huge amount of other fellas so even then, I'm a bit like, like it was not in a dangerous position. It wasn't a profession. I didn't. Like it, someone just skipped by her, stuck her leg out. These things happen. I think you give her the benefit of the doubt. If she'd done two or three of them, you give her a yellow card. Now maybe I'm erring on the side of the defender a little bit here, but I just don't like seeing players sent off unjustly unless there's like. With the, unless they've been stupid themselves in terms of making tackles or less, yeah, it's the last minute of the game and they actually are time-wasting and it's work getting the yellow mm. card for. Yeah, it's interesting because yeah. I was listening to Kate Longhurst talk about it um, and she's, Emily Heaslip was the referee and she was also the referee that gave Katie McCabe that kind of very soft yellow card in the first game as well. And she her point of view was interesting because she's been officiated by Emily Heaslip and she was like, I actually can't really fully understand what happened in this game because normally... She is really good at, you know, talking to you or giving you a warning or explaining why a certain decision has been made or whatever it might be, which I thought was an interesting perspective because obviously the majority of what we've heard over the weekend is the likes of Casey Stoney or Beth Mead or even us here talking about it being like, what was going on? So then you have to think that it's coming from her association that the pressure is being put on the referee based on conversations they're having outside the pitch but I think inside the pitch you use your discretion mm-hmm. to, to avoid negatively impacting the game because we should never be talking about the referee after a game was there any responsibility on the side of the city players in that it was very clear that anyone who dissented or gave off was probably going to get a yellow card is there any responsibility there for you know senior players in the squad to pull everyone together and be like look we get this is frustrating but just shush until the end of the match it's so hard to do and from experience sometimes you can tell people to calm down and that only riles them up even further (laughs) especially you know for hemp's first yellow card she had just been polaxed in the box and she should have gotten a free out she didn't get it so she was chasing around chasing around she ended up um the uh, corner given that she didn't think was a corner reacted yeah you can't speak to the referee you do need to kind of knock that on the head so maybe that yellow card and then after that she does pull down Lauren James but it's it's so 
again, I'm just kind of like, how many tackles had she made at that point? Does her two indiscretions warrant City being down another player? Mm. And like, we don't know what was said. Maybe it was something bad, but sometimes you're just in the heat at the moment and you can apologize three seconds later and maybe you give the player the chance to do that. But yeah, I don't know. I did know when mm. I came on to talk to this about you that like nonsense was going to be one of the first words out nonsense. of your mouth. So <laughs> I'm, I'm glad I did get that right. But yeah, Leaf City in a strange place because as you said, they've probably been one of the most impressive teams so far in the league. If you take like the the traditional top teams, obviously what Leicester and Liverpool have done is really good. Um, and even if if they had 11 players on the pitch, I really do feel like they probably would have beaten Chelsea at the weekend with the opportunities. Like Even when they were down, Bunny Shaw had so many chances in those last 10 minutes to give them the lead or double their lead. Um, and it was very unfortunate that Gore Rayton did manage to get that last minute goal. But yeah, they're looking like strong contenders this year, which will be an interesting one. To look at the yeah, top... I, oh. Yeah, I just thought it was interesting that Emma Hayes seemed quite happy with that result, you know. Um, we expect Chelsea to have such high standards that they expect to win every game, but I guess City had won that fixture back in March, and now they're probably an even more settled team. Mm. And they started the game really, really well, so I think for her to be happy with a point, given that they were... But Chelsea have an awful record nine. away for mm. City as well, so I think that probably fed into it yeah. a little bit. But um, I think a lot of credit goes to, to City for the way they performed. That even when they conceded the goal, they were down to eight because I think um, they had a player off the pitch because of... Mm. Uh, Alana Kennedy was... Uh, yeah, Alana Kennedy was off the pitch. Yeah. But yeah, it was a madness game and we do love that, but maybe not because of the referee. Yeah, no, definitely. <laughs> um, to look, to give Liverpool their credit a little bit more and also mm -hmm. Matt Beard, I feel. So Liverpool 2, Aston Villa nil. Carla Ward said after the game that Villa were not good enough in any department, that it was one of the worst performances they've put out as a team. It's a reality check. Everyone is talking about us as a top four side and we are miles off that at the moment. I think it's probably a pretty fair assessment of where yeah, Aston Villa and it was, were. Yeah, uh, and it was the best part of the Villa performance was her interview after, I thought, because it was... She was not pleased at all. And you can understand why, because, like, I mean, you just expect better from Villa based on how they were last season. Um, and the talent in the team as well. Yeah, they're a proper good team. And I, used to, I loved watching them last season. I love when they got in their flow. Um, I think that they're massively missing Hansen and Dali in mm. particular. Daly's not getting the service that she did previously and like she's kind of having to dig out headers and stuff the kind of half chances more than anything and when you have someone like Dali who can kind of just create space for a striker um even with her movement never mind her passing range um it, it changes the the dynamic of the whole attack and yeah they 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 did attack and then Liverpool used play to their strengths and they very much targeted it I think that that left hand side they were really really strong down there should we be and, talking yeah. about Liverpool as a potential kind of like on the edge of going for a Champions League place? I don't know if they're maybe there this season, but if people were kind of saying Aston Villa could push and we haven't seen that from them so far. Again, I know very early days, but mm. everyone loves a good early prediction. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> maybe on the outside, maybe on the outside chance. Um I still think the top four will be Chelsea, City, um, Arsenal, United. Um, but who knows? There might be a bolter. Maybe it'll be Liverpool. I'd be surprised if it was this year. I think uh, if they improve on last season, given the stature of the club, another season in the WSL would do wonders and it'll attract even more players um, but in the way that Man United did. Do you, I was going to say, do you see them going on a possible trajectory in the same way that United did in those couple, like, four years or so where they built slowly, but you could very much see what the project is? And, like, they have Matt Beard in there, who's possibly the best manager in the WSL at the moment to lead that sort of trajectory for them? Yeah, and I think that they've um, they've done well to, to strengthen their squad and the fact that they had subs who could come off the bench and impact the game the way that, you know, Morley and Flint linked up for the second goal. And it was a brilliant second goal. Morley did so well down the left. And then Flint's touch and turn in one movement and her finish um, was brilliant. So 
I think to be competitive, obviously, in the WSL, a lot of it has to do with your strength and depth. And we see that from the likes of Arsenal and Chelsea and how much they've had that over the last few years. And that's why they've been up and, and so dominant. Mm. So I think that's the that's the challenge is to have a good season so that you can again keep attracting players because as much as it, it shouldn't, the name the name carries a lot of weight based on the history of the men's clubs. Um, but that's also a good thing because it attracts talent from outside of England and Europe and we're seeing even Brazilian and, you know, Japanese players coming in and they're only adding to the league. So um, I think they should be using that stature, but in order to use it, they have to have a, another good season this year. And a good season now, based on the start they've had, is yeah. placing a, a couple of places or three or four places higher than they did last season. Well, it's lining up to be a very interesting season, just judging off the first two rounds of fixtures so far. A quick whip around all the other games that happened. Uh, Leicester beat Everton 1-0. Good news for the Irish fans there. Heather Payne play, has started that game and Megan Campbell also made her debut, which is great to see that she's back on the pitch. Mm-hmm. You also had um, Robert Villaham getting his first victory as Tottenham Mandred beating Bristol City 3-1. No play for Chloe Mustaki there. She was on the bench, but um, Martha Thomas, who got her second goal in two games for Tottenham, which they will be happy to see with Beth England still out after getting hip surgery. And then we had Rianne Skinner getting her first victory with West Ham. They beat Brighton 2-0. Um, in terms of the other Irish players around the place, bit of a worry around Caitlin Hayes. She limped off at, in, Gla- at in Celtics match versus Glasgow last Thursday and didn't play on Sunday versus Motherwell. Mark Skinner confirmed no Aoife Mannion for another 10 weeks, so we'll unlikely see her in the next international window. Ni Fahi, Leanne Kiernan, Jessu, Jesse Stapleton, Rusha Littlejohn, all still out injured. So once again, our injury list is looking great. Uh, Amber Barrett scoring two goals, which we are happy to see in standard Liège's 3-2 defeat to the league leaders over there. Abby Larkin made her full Glasgow City debut. Um, and of course, we also had Denise O'Sullivan setting a club record with North Carolina Courage for most regular season minutes, proving her worth there once again. The Koi Gig Pod and Off the Ball, sponsored by Cabri, official snack partner to Republic of Ireland women's national team. Karen, thank you very, very much. I will chat to you, you again Karen. next week. And hopefully we will have Emma Byrne back once she has finished doing super important secret Irish national team stuff. <laughs> and thanks everyone <laughs> who listened in. As I said, we will be back next week with all the WSL action. Um, and if you want to get in touch with us, please do at the Koi Gig Pod on Twitter. Thank you very much for listening. The Koi Gig Pod on Off The Ball in association with Cadbury, official snack partner of the Republic of Ireland women's national team.